Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. Phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It's a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's one 450 6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. Happy to be back in Grand Forks. Happy to be back with you. Literally, I was saying on Twitter right before the show, literally the highlight of my entire week, this one hour to do this show. I have had a a crazy cool week traveling all over the place, doing some really cool things, uh, some of which are going to make an appearance here on the Ask Noah Show. Maybe not tonight, but at some point. Now, as you know, as we talked about going forward from episode 100, one of the things that we want to do is become more involved with the community. We want to incorporate the community. We want to give a voice to the community and we want to take into account your feedback. And one piece of feedback that I have seen over and over and over again is for a gentleman uh, to make an appearance on the show. And uh, this gentleman is, is uh, his, his name is Brent. And essentially what he does is he is an open source photographer. Uh, uh, Brent Gervais is his name, and he's joining us in our interactive mumble room. You also can be a part of the conversation by joining us in our on-air channel in that interactive mumble room. Hey, mumble room, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hello, Noah. Hey. Good day. Good day. Hey. hey now. Good. Good to see all you guys. Um, so Brent is in here in the in the uh, in the mumble room with us, and uh, Brent, I, I guess you know it's this isn't really a we didn't really plan a lot. It's not not a huge formal thing, but I just wanted to get you on the show because there is a a community that has popped up inside of as an offshoot of the Ask Noah show, people that want to do open source photography. They've even formed their own telegram group. And uh, the telegram group is called the Ask Noah show photography channel. And uh, these guys just talk about open source photography. And one of the people in there has sent into the show once or twice, actually, actually a couple of people have sent in an email and said, Hey, there's that Brent guy. And he is a professional open source photographer. I understand that, he uh, has a has a workflow that he's managed to work out. And so I was just wondering if you could tell us that story. How did you, first of all, let's start with this. How did you get into photography and why? You know, it's actually a, a, a question that uh, gets asked all the time. And uh, I have this really kind of neat story to it. Um, thankfully for me, it was a bit of an accident that turned out to be uh, really good. Um, so I'm, I'm here in Canada and, uh, you know, as kids, most of us end up playing hockey and I ended up busting my arm up, um, as a kid. Uh, but it was like the last hockey game of the season or something like that. So what that means is my summer was basically me stuck in a brace, not doing anything. And, uh, what was really great was my father had what was then one of the early digital cameras. Uh, it wasn't the diskette ones, but, uh, but uh, he basically had the foresight to say, hey, you know what, you're stuck here and you're not able to really do much over the summer. Um, here's a camera. Maybe you could just play with that and occupy some time. And so what ended up happening was this love of something I had never discovered before just sort of happened and uh, been doing it ever since and doing it professionally as my um, main income stream, I'd say. And uh and it's been great. So did you start out with a open source photography workflow or did you start with the commercial side and work your way back? So I remember when I started, um, I was using uh, Windows. It was, I don't know, Photoshop 7 back then. And that was, those were the tools that everybody was using. I was just, I was young. I was like, I think I was uh, like about 15. So, um, but still had a huge interest in computers at that time, mostly from my older brother who would pass that kind of stuff on and uh, i remember playing with linux back then um but just didn't have enough know how to you know do the photography stuff in linux at that time and linux was a bit of a different beast back then as far as uh, the desktop side of things so 
I, I remember playing a whole bunch with it, uh, early KDE and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, but it wasn't really, um, I'll say production ready for the kind of stuff I was trying to do. Sure. So, uh, used windows for a while, maybe, maybe like four years, something like that. Then went off to uh, college here and was forced to buy a Mac despite my, um, expressing how much I didn't want to. Um, so was on Mac for probably another four to five years, something like that. And then just couldn't stand either of those and uh, just moved to Linux. And that was more from a philosophical standpoint. I thought, okay, if I'm going to be running a business for the next, who knows how many of years, um, I would far prefer to invest my money in something I believe in instead of something I didn't. So that's how it came about. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I completely agree. And I completely understand where you're coming from. Cause I, I mean, I, I didn't, I, I don't think I was ever forced to buy a laptop per se, but I, I majored in communication when I was in college. And so my entire, uh, I guess the rest of my class was on a different platform and, and was not receptive to Linux. And so if I wanted to graduate, I had to use that platform. Um, so I do understand where you're coming from there. I know this is going to come up. I know this is going to be a question among the photography gurus, even if it's not so applicable to the Linux and open source guys among us. What brand did you go with? Are you a Canon guy? Are you a Nikon guy? Sony? Panasonic? Yeah. So I always say like the most important camera is the one you have and the one you're using. Uh, so these days, especially with cameras, it doesn't really matter in the sense that they're all producing really great results and they're all fairly user friendly but uh, but I got roped into Nikon a little while ago uh, I would say for, well when I first started actually some of my mentors were big Nikon fans and uh, uh, at that time I was just trying to um, replicate what they were doing they were doing some great work and so it was easiest for me to, to grab the equipment they had uh, these days I'm still using a DSLR Nikon stuff um, you know once you invest in a whole bunch of gear and lenses and stuff like that it makes the a change to something else a bit more mm, difficult I'll say um, but there's a lot of people going mirrorless and Sony's doing some good stuff these days so um, yeah, whichever camera you have, it's what you do with it. And that's what I'd say. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a, an analogy here. Um, I've been doing some uh, broadcast studio consulting the past couple of weeks, and uh, one of the questions I get asked is, "Well, how much money do we have to spend to get a really good sound on the air?" And and what I tell them is that, you know, when if you go to a contractor that builds the world's best houses, and you sat him down and you said, "I, I want to talk to you about the tools that you use." And he says, well, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the DeWalt uh, Flexvolt power tools, 18-volt uh, lithium tools. I think they have a lot of power. I think they have a lot of durability. Throw them off a four-story building. The batteries recharge really fast. They retain a lot of power. All those things, right? And you tell this guy, I'm going to go buy you a $25 Black & Decker power drill from Walmart, and I want you to build me a house. Does anybody out there really believe that that $18 power tool versus the 200 and some dollar DeWalt power tool is going to make any measurable difference on the quality of this guy's work. It were if you gave a world renowned tennis player, I don't fall sports, but if you gave a world renowned tennis player, a rickety old wooden racket and you bought me the, I'm going to really show my sports ignorance here, but you bought me the, uh, a brand new fiberglass, fantastic, super top of the you know line, you know, tennis racket. Would it give me any measurable advantage over that tennis player? Absolutely not. And, and I, and I use that as an illustration to kind of, I think what you're trying to say, the tools, a good professional will make use of good tools and will find a way to leverage those tools to his or her advantage. But for those that are starting out in photography, if somebody's listening to this show and they're saying, I want to get into photography, I think I could capture the world around me. I think I could capture moments, Brent, they don't have to spend hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars in equipment to do that. No, please, please don't. Um, because as you explore any kind of profession, you learn to like the little niche that you find for yourself in it. So, so many people I know have purchased, you know, equipment and then realized, oh, geez, actually, I would have preferred that other piece of equipment, but I didn't have the knowledge at the time to go in that direction. So I would say, especially with cell phones these days, like start with whatever you have in your hand. And once you reach the wall where actually that device doesn't do what you want to do anymore, then consider it. But try to use that device, camera, phone, whatever, as much as you possibly can and get 
everything you can out of it and more. And that'll actually make you, uh, like I have a sort of a tinkering, trying to figure out how things work and then break them kind of mentality for everything. So if you can bring that to photography, for instance, since that's the topic here, you can you can make your phone do a whole bunch of stuff you never even thought of. I've, I've built cameras out of scanners and old uh, 8x10 cameras and stuff like that. It, it really doesn't matter what you're using, just produce an image. So I can't remember the name of this device, but uh, so uh, I'll go ahead and just go on the record. I'm a Nikon guy. I really am. And, uh, and I'm a Nikon guy because I like buttons. One of the things, having used the Canon Rebels and the Nikon side by side, what I have found, me personally, what I found is that you have to dig into a lot of menus to get the Canon camera to do what I want. Um, Nikon gives me, you know, dials and buttons for me to be able to do those things. Yeah, you and, and me, me both, for sure. So I have just come to appreciate the Nikon way of doing things. Now, that's not to say there's anything wrong with Canon. I think Canon mains, makes an absolutely fantastic camera. It's a true professional choice. Nothing wrong with Canon whatsoever. But I'm just telling you that my preference, having used them both side by side, has be, been to come to Nikon. And of course, like you expressed early on, once you buy into an infrastructure, then you're kind of sold that bag of goods, as it were, right? Now you've got lenses and flashes and all these things that are specific to your camera ecosystem. And that's kind of where I'm at. But to your point about um, you've built cameras out of a bunch of different things. One of my favorite lenses, and I'll find, I don't have the name handy, but I'll go find the name and I'll throw it in the show notes at podcast.snoahshow.com. It's a lens that you basically squeeze on it and it will distort the bokeh or how do I say this, Brent? The, the depth of field, the autofocus elements, it will, it will shift where those autofocus elements are. And so you can create some very unique, very cool artistic photos. And this lens is like, it's not very much. It's like 60, 70 bucks. Are, are you talking about the, uh, I remember this a little while ago. Uh, is this recent or not? But I remember there was something called the lens baby that you can yes. just kind of like, yeah, that's it. The it's lens like this, baby. There you go. Um, from what I remember about it, I'd never owned one, but I've played with a few. Um, it's almost like a plastic tube that you can kind of curve around and change the bokeh. That's the out of focus, like circles that are in the background of an image. And it, you can produce all sorts of wacky results with that, with basically a plastic lens, right? Um, which is super fun to do. So for those of you that are, for those of the the audience that they're out there, and maybe you're sitting there and you're listening to the show and you're saying to yourself, well, I was told by my photography instructor, I was told by my professor, I was told by whoever that you had to have Adobe Lightroom or you had to have Photoshop or whatever mm -hmm. the, you know, mm -hmm. proprietary alternative is these days. What do you say to people like that, Brent? You process photos on an open source Linux platform. You do this for a living at a professional level. Your clients demand the same results from you as they would from any other photographer because, as we all know, it's not like you get a pass just because of your chosen operating system. You have to deliver the you have to deliver equal results. What do you say to somebody like that? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's easy to get into the trap of, hey, I need to buy whatever and that will make me a better professional. Um, but that's a really dangerous path to go down. Um, so what I say to someone who says, oh, I can't do photography because I don't have Lightroom or I don't have Photoshop or I don't have, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, the reality I think today is that we have a lot of options and not all of those options are necessarily tied to dollars. So for anyone starting out, and I, I, I did this at a Makers Fest, I, I sort of this was a few months ago, I taught a course about anybody who wants to get into photography. You go to one website, you download one piece of software, and it'll do everything that the professionals do. Um, so, and I'll, we'll get into that software in a minute, I'm sure. But what was amazing to me when I was um, sort of presenting this piece of software um, in front of this wild group of people who showed up to this maker press, there was, you know, dad who was just retired and wanted to learn photography and there was also like some kids that were running around and they decided to sit down and start playing with this piece of software and what was amazing to me was that the kids caught on super quickly and so did everybody else to this piece of software that a is free to download for anyone to try and use uh, is open source which is always really great and doesn't have any barriers to entry so anyone could just sit down and start using it so um so it was really great to see that the professional piece of software that I use is also accessible to everybody. 
And so now I say, don't even bother with the Photoshops and the Lightrooms. Go use something like Darktable first and go play with that. And if, you, if then you can't accomplish something, then consider the others. Now, that, that's excellent advice. Absolutely fantastic advice. So, Brent, I just want to start from the beginning. I want to start picking your brain. You've gone out to a wedding or a party or, I don't know, somebody's birth, whatever it is that people pay you to take pictures of, and, uh, and you capture these images of somebody's life. What now? You've got these, I assume you shoot in RAW. Always. Okay, so, and for those of you who are not aware, there's two ways to capture images. The first way is you can record the actual data that the sensor captures, and you can write that out to a memory card. The second way that you can do it is you can tell the camera's built-in processor to take that raw camera data and process it into a compressed image like a JPEG, which we would all uh, you know, be able to open on our phones and computers and so on and so forth. The problem with doing that, and why Brent probably doesn't do that, and why we would never recommend that you shoot in anything other than raw, uh, is because this file allows you to adjust uh, components and controls of the photo of the photograph so for example the white balance that is the way that the camera interprets colors as it relates to white so it uses white as a as essentially a baseline and then it 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 corrects all of the other colors in the photo based off of what it believes to be white if that color is wrong to begin with then all of the rest of the colors in your photograph are going to be off and you have the great ability, because it has the raw sensor data, even if you've not calibrated your camera to show the camera what true white is, the sensor data is the same regardless. So when you pull it into the computer, you can then in post tell the camera or tell the photograph, the image processing software, hey, this is what real white is in this photo. And the photo processing software will go back and say, okay, well, based on that, here's what the picture would look like. And that's just one of many examples of things that you can do if you save that raw sensor data and don't throw it out for a compressed image. But so you get back with your raw files, Brent, you sit down at your Linux free and open source computer. What now? Well, always my uh, first concern is backups. Um, I even create, you know, I always, I always want to have as many copies of these photos in as many different places as possible, especially, so I used to do, just to give a little bit of background, I used to do weddings, that's how I first started out, I've done hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, now I do mostly commercial work and editorial work, so for magazines and things like that, but uh, the same concepts apply. So I go on location somewhere and I take a whole bunch of really meaningful photos and so my very first concern, even before I get home, you know, even in my car, I, I never, you know, these are little things that I have created, but I never put my camera bag at the back of the car because if I get rear-ended, there's a chance that those photos will get wrecked. So I always put it in the middle of the car and maybe, you know, I've never run into a situation where I need that. But the main concept is backup. So if I get home, the very first thing I do, and I have the same process that I go through every single time, is open my camera bag, plug the batteries, you know, into a charger. But the most important thing is start creating backups of those photos. So some on my laptop. So then now I've got two copies, right? I have one on the card, one on my laptop, and I will also put them on a, a my backup system. Okay. So we have the photographs backed up. So now they're safe. So they can't be, they, they will unlikely to be destroyed. And uh, you won't have to call somebody and tell them that they they lost their once in a lifetime event, but how yeah, do we don't ever, don't ever make that phone call. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, at least not if you want to maintain a, a continued business. So, I mean, what do we do? Do we just uh, compress those files up and email them off to the client or is there some post-processing that has to occur? Yeah. So for, for someone like me, uh, I, I, I would describe myself as kind of an, I, I lean a little bit more to a realistic end product. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really pushing these photos into the surreal aspect at all. Uh, I'm trying to reproduce reality, but in a really clean way. Uh, but even then, I would say that I, I never hand to a client or even a friend or otherwise a photo that comes straight out of the camera. Um, and the reason for that is that, um, well, there's a few reasons. I think the first is that there's a big part of the creativity and of the personality of the photographer that can come out in uh, the processing of an image. 
So even if it's little tweaks that you make um, as far as contrast or, you know, color like you were saying or um, some density and things like that, um, there's a there's there's just this look that each photographer can establish. Uh, and it might just be through um, sort of the workflow that they've established. Um, but I think that's actually a really important part is that um, there's, a, there's a lot of creativity that happens once you sit down on your laptop and you start taking in these photos in a whole different way than in, in real time. So uh, I will always sit down and start first editing the photos, which means, and this term gets overused perhaps but when i'm referring to editing what i mean is actually editing like taking out the photos that someone was blinking or i screwed up the settings or whatever that aren't going to be published basically um so i'll edit them down usually to about um at least a third of the photos oftentimes i'm taking you know 10 photographs of the same scene and maybe one or two of those are worth considering and the rest are just kind of repetitious or aren't the best out of that that scene so sure. editing is really the first part and um that's worth taking the time to do because it means that after i'm done i'm only looking at a third of the photos and it's way less daunting to get through the task of then uh, manipulating them a little bit further sure absolutely and you know one of the things um that i think is you and i agree on i was taught uh I was always taught you crop in the camera, not in the dark room. And the idea is you get the picture right. There's there's a there's a real temptation in 2018 because we have 4K cameras, because we have 5K cameras to go ahead and take a picture and just kind of get don't bother trying to frame the picture up. Just take pictures and then get back into your your dark room or into your uh, computer and go ahead and just crop the picture to get what you want. And I'm not saying that's a wrong way to do it. It's certainly an effective way to capture a photograph. And we certainly have the resolution to allow you to do that. But what you need to understand is that every photograph you're taking, you are throwing away information. And so if you can learn to properly utilize optical zoom, to properly utilize the proper lens to frame the picture that you want, you can expend those pixels capturing greater quality of the exact frame you want rather than capturing a huge image that you don't want to, to crop it down to the quarter of the image or whatever it is that you do. Um, and so I, I disagree. It's just a, it's a, it's a person, it's a way that I go about doing things. It sounds like it's the way that you go about doing things. It's yeah, not necessarily, absolutely. it's not necessarily that there's a right or wrong way to do it. Um, but that's always my preference. Um, what software specifically do you use to make these light edit editing? Um, so I will touch a little bit on your uh, cropping in photos yeah, and then please. I'll get to the software. So I, one of my favorite um, exercises to suggest to anyone who's getting into photography or even someone who's been in photography for a while uh, is get yourself what is one of my favorite lenses, especially to start out, which is a 50 millimeter 1.8. Mm. Um, all the brands have it. They're extremely inexpensive. They're like $100 for one of the Nikon versions. Um, and the best thing about that lens is it teaches you how to see. And it, so to speak to your cropping in camera, what it does is instead of allowing you to crop um, things on the computer, it forces you to use your feet to zoom in and zoom out. So you have to move your body around and see different perspectives of the same scene. And that really teaches you that, oh, wait, if I move to the left by two feet, this photo will be completely different. And that's something you can't do on the computer. Once you've snapped that photo, you can't move two feet to the left to, to rearrange everything in the background and the foreground. So it's really important to get it right in person as much as you can, and then use the software a little bit to, to either prop that up, everything you did right, to make it even more right. Or let's say you made a, a subtle mistake here and there. It can sometimes um, help soften those, let's say. Absolutely. So then on, on to your software, what I would recommend first for only almost anybody and does 80% of the on-computer work that I do would be Darktable. Uh, it's available on all platforms. I've used it on all platforms. Um, and so it it has a few different views and it's it's easy to see on their website or if you install this to see sort of how that works. And it's really an alternative 
well, I'll say it's modeled after something like Lightroom. And so it has an editing function. So it allows you to edit the photos down to the third, let's say, like I was saying. So it has a starring system. So that's really the first place that I go is I'll go in this editing mode in Darktable and start um, giving a few different stars or ratings, if you will, to photos. So I can give a five-star rating to a photo that I absolutely love and I know will be in the final cut. Uh, or I can give anywhere from one to three. So I'll often just go through real fast and pick the ones where I get an emotional reaction to, something that kind of stands out, and I'll give everything, the whole set of things that I love, just a one star, and then I'll go through the one stars again, and I'll give them sort of a more... Um, accurate ranking, I suppose, um, then I can decide, okay, I'm only going to ship the five stars to the client, or I'm only going to ship the four and five stars, you know, four above to the client, let's say. So uh, that's the first step. And from there, once I have that that subset of photos, I'll move into the, I, I guess it, it would be more the um, photo per photo editing mode, I suppose. Um, just the more of the in-depth workflow that goes into each photo. So that allows you, like you were saying earlier, to, to modify colors and do some cropping and uh, do all sorts of really fancy stuff. I'm only really talking about the basics. There's some sharpening in there and, and those kind of things. There's, sure. uh, there's more that that program can do than I even know. There's tons of modules and, and lots of stuff you can do. So if you're the kind of person who loves to dive in and... Um, try absolutely everything it's it's super powerful super super powerful i probably use a maybe 50 percent of what it can do um so there's lots of room to grow there too going back and tying kind of this entire conversation together you know for the past couple of topics if you can learn to be a talented photographer who pays attention to the details because that's what i find makes the difference in my in my photography is when i'm paying attention to details versus when i'm not paying attention to details if you can be that kind of photographer that notices the detail, hones in on it, and 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 gets it right, you lessen your need to spend a lot of time, if any, really at all, inside of the editing suite, and yeah. um and so and you shouldn't be right. You should be focusing on trying to take better photographs, not trying to be a better photo editor. We can all because there, at some point, it stops being become about photography and starts becoming artistic design. Right? I see some people. Not that there's anything against this, but I see some people do these very, very artistic photographs to the point that you would almost be better off just creating it from scratch. I mean, at some point, why even take a photograph? Why not just design it? We have the technology to do that. And so, you know, I very much come from your school of thought, trying to capture life and, and those kinds of things. Is there anything else uh, from a workflow or software perspective that we should be aware of? Um, I'd say Darktable is a great place to start. Um, I also end up using a few other small tools to accomplish things. Uh, I I absolutely have to mention the GIMP. Um, whenever I'm trying to accomplish something that's a little bit mm, outside of Darktable's scope, uh, the GIMP always sort of does it for me if you're trying to layer a bunch of stuff or do some masking or get rid of something in the background, for instance. Um, that covers the other you know, 19% of what I do with photography stuff on my laptop. Um, but little tools, even like um, batch renaming tools. Um, I'm using KRename right now, which is working out really well, but there's a whole bunch out there. Um, just keeping things as simple as possible, but using these tools to just accomplish that task works really well. Um, so I would say there's a, a little bit of a string of different tools, but but those that I've mentioned are, are doing the heavy lifting for me. Outstanding. Going back to equipment for just a second, if I can, Brent, you had mentioned that you suggest a 50 millimeter 1.8 for anybody that's getting started into photography. Interestingly enough, I believe, I think it was a 50 millimeter 1.4 was my first lens. Um, I just want to break down. There's a couple people in the chat and they're saying, yeah, I'm, you know, some of this talk is just a little confusing for me. Really, it's it's fairly simple for the if I was to put it into uh, simple English, the bigger the first number, the tighter the zoom the tighter the picture is so for example i have a 10 millimeter lens it's a very wide lens i can take a picture of basically an entire room with that lens from i don't know 15 feet away and i can see almost 180 degrees i mean that's how wide that lens is i mean it's a very wide lens conversely i have a 300 millimeter lens very big number, and so it's a very, very tight shot. So if I was to stand 15 feet away, I might see somebody's eyeball, and that would be about it. 
But if you go to a football field, now I can capture maybe four or five players from 50 feet away or 100 feet away. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's a very tight zoom. It's a, it's, you know, you're, you're looking very, very far. Is that an accurate summation of, of uh, focal length? Yeah, that's a nice, simple way of explaining it. I, I also like to give the reference that um, a 50 millimeter lens is about how each of us sees the world. So mm. whatever you can fit into your own vision is about a 50 millimeter lens. So if you're trying to get a little bit wider than that, then you have to reduce that number. And if you're trying to see something that's further than what you're used to seeing, then you have to increase that number. I like that. I, did, I wasn't aware that that was kind of a, I wasn't aware that that's where the 50 millimeter suggestion came from. Um, uh, it's not, you know, it's not precise, it's kind of a rule of thumb kind of thing, but there's all these little references that help grasp your mind around these concepts. Yeah, we're all different. So we all view things a little bit differently. The second number is, uh, is what we call the aperture. And, if, and, if, and essentially the aperture is how much light is being let into the lens. So the, I guess the lower the number, the, what we say, the faster the lenses, the more light that is going to be let in from the lens. Now that's one thing that's important or an aspect that is important to consider. But one of the things that I really like about very fast lenses are they allow you to blur the background, uh, drastically while keeping the focus of the initial image or whatever the subject matter in razor sharp focus. And so, and I have a picture and I'll, I'll make sure to share this on podcast.snoahshow.com. And Brent, if you have any suggestions, you can maybe send them to me and we can link to those as well that yeah, exemplify sure. this. But I have a picture of a bird and the bird is completely in focus and the fence, which is sitting only maybe five or six feet behind the bird just starts to look like a green blur because all of the trees and leaves and stuff that surround the fence blur in. So it doesn't have the ugly appearance that the actual background was. It was really fantastic. So, uh, for me, having those fast lenses allows me to achieve that blurring effect or that bokeh. And, uh, and I, I have found that um, if I can get a really tight zoom and a really slow or a really fast lens, then I can achieve that effect. Are there any other lenses like that that you use, Brent, that will provide a really cool effect or it, not just for capturing life, but maybe if you want to shoot like a portrait or somebody wants to accomplish something with that photograph, is there a lens that lends itself particularly well for that? Yeah, I there there like I said, there's some quick um, like easy go tos, and I can give a few of those. Um, it's important to sort of learn those, and then know when you can totally break them and and go somewhere else. Mm. Um, but having having a set of tricks in your toolbox uh, is a great place to start. Usually, if I'm doing a really stressful photo shoot, then I reach for those sort of um, shortcuts or that toolbox pretty quickly, and then I can get comfortable that I at least got something and move back from that so um you know there's a there's a whole bunch but a, a quick one that i would say is um if you're doing a portrait uh like an 85 millimeter lens would be a good place to start it okay it thins people down just slightly um uh, so that's a, a quick trick but I, i'm with you on the uh lower aperture uh, i tend to reach in that direction i shoot a lot of people and i don't I, I want to concentrate the photograph on the people, not on the backgrounds generally. So, um, so the, another trick is, you know, focus on people's eyes all the time. That's the thing. That's how we all interact in person is you look at someone's eyes first. So if a photograph is sharp in the eyes, it's going to feel more natural. If it's, if you know, you accidentally focused on someone's chest or their hand or something, then it, uh, it's just not going to have that same, same impact. Um, but as far as lenses go and that aperture trick, I would say, um, the aperture is really just a fancy word for, uh, the hole that's letting light into your, into your camera. Mm. So the bigger it is, the, the bigger it is, the more light that's going to come in. So for me, I have really, like you said, really fast lenses. So I use 2.8 lenses as much as I can or lower. Um, I'm not always photographing at that, but I almost always am close to it. Uh, but that's mainly because I am working in low light situations, being on location often, and I'm not a huge uh, studio shooter, so I'm not always bringing my own studio lights and things like that. So I'm working with natural light a lot. Um, and in that case, I, I want things to be sharp. Um, and so this is where 
all of the settings in your camera sort of play together. Aperture plays with shutter speed, plays with the sensitivity of your, your film or ISO. I said the F word, <laughs> but uh, of your sensor anyways. And uh, basically, photography, I always say, is is a set of compromises. So you got to choose what's most important in the scene. Is it that things are really sharp or is it that, you know, you freeze movement or something like that and optimize that setting on your camera? So maybe for you, you and that bird, the most important thing was getting the background to be super blurry so the bird really popped out. Well, then you're going to concentrate a little bit more on what your aperture is than your your shutter absolutely so brent for anybody that is out there maybe looking at getting into photography any parting words of of wisdom or this is what you should if you were to tell go back in time and tell yourself one thing starting out as a linux and open source photographer what would that thing be yeah that's that's a really great question and i i wish a little that i had uh, more time to think of that, and uh, but I, I will give an answer. And so, uh, if I was someone first starting out in photography right now, and um, I was interested in open source um, anything, I would say go find Darktable. Go find Darktable, whichever platform you're on, it doesn't matter. Uh, they have it for you, and um, just start playing. There's there's maybe three to five basic things I'll suggest that you do there, which is the exposure, color balance, you could do some cropping, and um, you probably have to know where the export function is so you get the photos out of there. But um, other than that, that piece of software is going to be a lot of fun. And if you have a phone, all phones have cameras, just start taking photos with that and play with them in Darktable. You can, you can bring them on your computer and play with them. And uh, that'll get you a long way just to seeing what's possible and from there you can start upgrading cameras and things like that if you want if you want to be a professional photographer i would say go find some go find some pro professional photographers and talk to them even if they use some different software you can learn a lot from spending a little bit of time on a photo shoot with someone who knows what they're doing so um if that's at all interesting to you go ask anybody really e whether you really look up to them or not um they're gonna they're gonna definitely show you something Brent Gervais, a photographer utilizing Linux and open source for his professional photography business and a guest this hour on the Ask Noah Show. Take a look at his work, brentgervais.com. We'll have a link for you on podcast.asknoahshow.com, on Twitter, at Brent Gervais. Hey, Brent, thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us. We, we'd love to get you back in the program real soon. Hey, thanks, Noah. And uh, can I ask you a quick uh, Ask Noah question? You bet. So I have been, this is unfortunately not photography related per se, but uh, I have been recently uh, interested in acquiring something like a hardware uh, encryption uh, key, like a YubiKey or something like that. And what I'm trying to really solve is this little um, problem or concept that I've been trying to unlock some Luke's en en encryption at boot time uh, on a few of my devices. So um, do you have some suggestions there? And maybe you can touch on um, maybe some do-it-yourself solutions or something like the Librem key or Nitro key? Absolutely. So there's you have a the, the good news is everybody is competing in this space. And so you have uh, you've got a lot of choices at your disposal. So I'll give a plug for my first choice, which would be the YubiKey. Now, there's a couple different ways that you can use the YubiKey, Brent, to authenticate into a hardware-like appliance that doesn't maybe have a network stack, or if it does have a network stack, does not have anything else running yet. Um, the first way it does require an internet connection is if you use something called PAM authentication, P-A-M. And essentially what PAM authentication does is it reaches out to a secondary server and performs an authentication task. And so people use PAM authentication. We've used it in, in server markets to authenticate into encrypted drives, encrypted storage. Um, we use it all the time to authenticate into uh, user credentials. So for example, you walk up to a machine, um, you can assign YubiKey to a PAM authentication module, and then the user can just walk up and it requires a physical token to be able to authenticate into, their, uh, into that workstation. So that's the first way you can go. Not the way I would choose because I don't like relying on third-party services, don't like having to rely on the internet. All of that is kind of out for me. So my personal choice would be to utilize the OTP module and store an insanely long uh, encryption password on that OTP module of the YubiKey. 
And you can use it then to, you, when your computer boots up and you want to decrypt the hard drive, then you can plug your YubiKey in and you can tap on the button. It requires physical presence, of course. And it will then spit out that 256 or whatever character uh, encryption decryption password and thereby decrypting your laptop. So it's not a true two-factor authentication because it requires, it doesn't require something you know, it just requires something you have. But the something you have is fairly easy to keep guarded, and as long as you keep the two separated, it provides adequate security to keep your laptop secure. That That's actually what I do. I have a YubiKey that I wear around my neck, and I use it to decrypt my laptop. So the only way that my laptop can be booted, even by me, is with physical possession of that device. Nice. I think that is exactly what I was looking for. Um, I, I think that important difference that you mentioned, too, is, is great, that it's not two-factor. And... Uh, you made me realize that that's not actually what I was looking for here, despite, you know, YubiKey typically being used for two-factor. Uh, this is really just unlocking via hardware method instead of um, using your fingers. I love it. Thanks again for joining us in the interactive mumble room. We appreciate you. We appreciate what you're doing with open source and photography. And thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Hey, thanks for having me. And I just want to say an extra thanks um, to you, actually, um, because it was on Ask Noah in the spring that I said, hey, I'm thinking of going to Linux Fest Northwest. Do you think uh, that's a good idea? And I remember you specifically took my call off air. So after the show and you said, yeah, absolutely go and it'll be the best time ever. And that sort of really kicked my um, involvement in the Linux community. And I just so I got to say thanks. Yeah, the, the Linux Fest Northwest is just a fantastic place to go to build community relationships and 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 all of that. So I'm 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 thrilled that that worked out, and I'm I'm glad that we were able to kind of build a friendship on side of that. I look forward to to continuing both the friendship and the uh, the work relationship as it relates to photography and and coming on here and telling our audience uh, how to do photography on Linux. Sounds good. I'd be happy to be here anytime. Appreciate it. One eight fifty five four fifty Noah. That's eight five five four five zero six six two four. The email live at asknoahshow dot com. Matt joins us from Arizona. Hey Matt, thanks for hanging in there. Hey, Noah. Uh, thanks for taking the call, actually. And before we get started, let me go ahead and wish you an early happy Thanksgiving, since uh, I don't know when you're going to cut me off when we finish. Uh, <laughs> that I've developed a bit of a reputation, have I? No, I, I fully understand why you do it, and, and it's completely tolerable, not a problem. I was just wanting to get it in early before you. I didn't have this opportunity. So, uh, last week I had called in with a car 29 problem. It wasn't booting, or it was, it was booting, but I wasn't able to log into the uh, desktop. Now, you had mentioned or, or encouraged me to uh, toggle back over to the Fedora 28 installation instead of the 29 through the grub menu. I did, and it was still giving me the same issue. So I dug deeper into it and went so far as to install uh, Ubuntu on it able to use live uh, USBs to get in. Um, hey, Matt, I, your phone is breaking up there a little bit. Uh, can you just restate the, the last thing that you just said? Yes, I apologize. Looks like I just transitioned from a cell tower. Uh, so what was the last thing you heard? That you, uh, we, you, you, you were in the process of taking my recommendation, and we didn't hear the results of that. Okay, so uh, through, through some testing, figured out that uh, there must have been some sort of a corrupted setting in my home directory. I had been trying to maintain that directory through the different installations. And uh, ultimately, I just wiped the entire machine, started with a fresh install, and okay. it now works without a problem after upgrading to 29. Okay. So, I mean, we got there. It was, so that's obviously not an ideal solution, but we got there. Well, yeah, it was, it was, it, it was more of an application as far as trying to figure out what the problem was. Uh, and I didn't necessarily nail down as tightly as I think either of us would have preferred, but it was, it was just an, uh, an ex, uh, an example, uh, an exercise. There it is. That's the word. Sure. I I appreciate you following up with me, and uh, by the way, I'll just let you know. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family as well. I hope you have a very enjoyable and relaxing Thank you. and relaxing weekend. But I uh, this is one of those things where I don't really particularly care for uh, the upgrade method. I'm really a big fan of nuke and pave, 
And there's going to be people out there that are going to hear that and they're going to say, well, if you used a good operating system like Windows or Mac OS, then you wouldn't have to worry about those things. But I, I don't, I actually don't like the upgrade process on in any operating system because fundamentally it's a compromise if you think about it. It always is. If you're going from one version to the other, you have library, you have files, you have junk essentially that came with that last thing that you no longer need and you're dragging along simply from for the for the express purpose of not starting from a clean slate. Um, so I don't like it. And so for that reason, I'm, I'm a big fan of duking and paving. Obviously, that's not a great answer on the show because, well, people have data and they have lives and they have other things they'd rather do than rebuild their machine from scratch. Um, yeah, you're, you're correct. But the answer to that is is backups. Uh, and yes. You can probably bash on Windows. I have a friend that uh, was still on Windows 7, and for whatever reason, he was having issues with, with the upgrade. It would break every time he would try and run it. And it just got to a point where it failed entirely. He had to wipe the, the entire machine and start over. <laughs> so uh, it, I don't think the upgrade on, on any operating system is, is going to be uh, as safe, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. as far as not having the issues there. Uh, I, I could go either way, uh, honestly, myself, with, with upgrading or with nuking and paving. Uh, I, I prefer upgrading myself just because I was I first introduced to Gen 2 system, and that was that that was fun, lots of fun. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, I think it's going to be a personal preference as far as which option you want to do. Right. And it was more of, of as I said, an exercise in playing with the DNS upgrade system. Sure, yeah. And I appreciate you calling me back and letting me know how that goes because sometimes we don't always hear from we don't always hear from you guys on how that stuff works out. So I definitely appreciate you taking the time to do that. And thanks again for the call and joining us from Arizona. Gordon joins us from Minneapolis. Hey, Gordon, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hi. Uh, I have a question about um, Wi-Fi card in my laptop. So I have a Lenovo laptop and the Wi-Fi card wasn't all that great anyway, but it, it went out and stopped working completely and it wasn't recognized by the operating system. So I just bought a cheap like Intel Centrino Wi-Fi card to replace it, popped it in, and uh, my laptop refused to boot. And mm -hmm. my office said that I was using an unauthorized Wi-Fi card. Is there any way to fix that? Or do I just have to... Get a, get a replacement for the stock Wi-Fi the, the realistic answer is no, there's no way to fix that. The full answer is yes, there is a way to fix it, but it involves uh, soldering, desoldering, all sorts of crazy in-depth things. This is one of the things that drives me absolutely bonkers uh, at Lenovo. I, I, bought a, I bought a T420, and there were only two things I didn't like about it. One was that the screen resolution was too low, and the second was that the Wi-Fi card was was too slow. And uh, I couldn't do much about the screen, but there are plenty of Intel Wi-Fi cards that I knew would work as good, if not maybe even a little bit better with Linux. Guess what happens when I go to try and put one in? All of a sudden, I get the same thing. It's not on their whitelist, and so I, the computer won't boot. And there is absolutely no reason to do that. And and Lenovo has nothing more than chicken butt excuses on how they're trying to pre prevent users from uh, from harming their computer, from not giving them an un unusable experience by preventing them from putting cards that they haven't, you know, quote unquote, tested with uh, with Lenovo hardware. And their answer to that is to make the machine completely unbootable, and somehow that's supposed to fix the problem. I mean, it just it, there is I, I, the, the problem infuriates me so much. It's difficult for me to even talk about it, Gordon. Um, but the 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 there you you essentially have two options: either you become very good at soldering and become essentially an electrical engineer, and there is a way to fix it, and there are guides to do it. I wouldn't recommend doing that. Your second option is to go if you Google. Lenovo whitelisted cards, there's actually a list based on models of which cards are whitelisted, and oftentimes, this is what I did for my T420, oftentimes you can find an upgraded card, you just have to buy the specific model that Lenovo blesses. Okay. So I don't have to go with the same Wi-Fi card even that came with the laptop, I could still upgrade. You can, yes. That sounds good. Yep. Yeah, and it's... it's right, a, I'll take a look at the... Yeah, do that. And, and I, I apologize. 
I apologize on Lenovo's behalf, even though I have nothing to do with them, because it's just a stupid, stupid, stupid decision. And it's one of those things that it's really out of Apple's playbook, if you think about it. This idea that, well, we know best for you. We know what you want to do and what you don't want to do. And if you do something that you don't want to do, we'll make sure that you can. It just, just drives me nuts. It's like... It's like John Deere licensing their the use of their technology rather than actually buying it. Covered that earlier in the Ask Noah show as well. I'll make a phone call here, here real quick. We got something fun to do. Um, if, you, if you're not aware, you should join our brand new interactive mumble room. It is Pound Ask Noah Show on Freenote. Let's see if we can make this work. Hello. Hey, hey, citizen. Hey. Hey, this is Noah from the Ask Noah Show. How are you? I'm uh, very good. Great. Thanks for taking the time to uh, to to chat with us. Hey, I just wanted to let you know that we were doing a drawing for the 100th uh, episode of the Ask Noah Show for those that joined our brand new Spanky IRC room, Pound Ask Noah Show on Freenode, and you won a hundred dollar gift certificate to Amazon.com. Oh, I was not expecting that. Do you have something Linuxy that you might want to buy off of Amazon.com? Uh, I have several things uh, on my list of things to put on my wish list, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's stuff. Mostly uh, single board uh, computers, that kind of thing. Ah, very cool, but, like uh, the Arduino kind of stuff, Raspberry Pi kind of thing. Yep, yep. I like those things, and uh, always in need, always useful. That's very cool. Well, we're happy that we're able to help with that. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and put you back on hold, and uh, what we'll do is we'll have uh, Sarah R. Carl screen and pick up, and she'll take down your particulars, and uh, we'll get that Amazon gift card mailed out to you. And thanks again for being both a listener to the Ask Noah Show and for joining us in our chat room, Pound Ask Noah Show on Freenode. Again, open phones this hour, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Make your voice heard. Become a part of the program. By the way, the chat room is saying that they thought I meant IRC room. Okay, guys, let's not, <laughs> let's not get the fact, let's not, let, let's not let the facts get in the way of what we're trying to say here, okay? Yes, I meant the IRC room. Imagine for a moment that you have a great idea for internet certificates. And it's such a great idea that VeriSign buys out your company and your idea for 575 million buckaroos. Now imagine that you're looking at the technology landscape and you decide you want to do something with this $575 million that you've bought or that you've earned. You don't want to do something amazing for a corporation. You don't want to do something necessarily just to make another buck. You just want to do something amazing for your neighbor because your mother wants to stay in contact with her family because your brother just wants to be able to do his schoolwork. And right now they're unable to do those things because the technology gets in the way because Mac OS and windows do idiotic things. Well, frankly, like uh, whitelisting drivers, that's a, that's a very Mac OS or windows thing to do. And so you invent Ubuntu. You invent an alternative operating system based on Linux and open source that you know is going to have the best you, the best interest of the user at heart. And you put that Linux distribution for human beings on a five year support cycle. And throughout the entire, your entire career and throughout the entire history of your software product, you are told by all of the people using it, by all of the geeks, that rolling is the future. Rolling is the way to go. Five years, that's way too long in Linux world. That's way too long in technology space at all. You should not be doing five years. You should be, it should be rolling. It should be fresh, up to date. That's what we need. And then you look over at your competition. And your competition is seeing servers in production for 10 years. And so as you're, as you're looking at that and you're saying, well, wait a minute. But wait a minute, we have all of the installs. If you look at raw numbers, there's way more people using our product than theirs. But then you look over at your competition and they're making all the money. They're making billions because their users are paying for their product. They're not using it for free. Well, why, when we offer a paid product, are people not using our product? Why would they, we have so much more mar- market penetration, we have so much more market dominance, why are they paying to use that thing over there? 
And then it dawns on you. Because the people over there that are paying for that 10-year product, that are willing to pay money for every install, they can run their mission-critical stuff on it. And they can trust that they're not going to have to swap something out halfway down the road. They, they can trust that when they put something on their servers, on their workstations, they can base infrastructure off of it. They're not going to get hit with a, you know, multi-thousand, tens of thousands of dollars of expense for a necessary upgrade. Well, starting now, Ubuntu 1804 is going to be supported for 10 years. That was announced this week. Quote, in some industries like financial service, telecommunications, but also from IoT where manufacturing lines, for example, are being deployed and will be in production for at least a decade. They, Canonical is essentially adopting Red Hat's model for support. I mean, realistically. Now, this there are a couple of things that I want to clarify, and there are a couple of things that I want to specify. So, for example, this is only going to be for customers that are paying for it and it's only for the server now to me those are two major major downfalls because i think that on the desktop market ubuntu dominates so i think that may be a missed opportunity for them i think it might be and i may be wrong about that you're welcome to let me know at live at asknoahshow.com you're welcome to call us at 855-450 noah but i think that's a missed opportunity i also question the way that they go about some of these things. So, for example, 1804, they picked a kernel that is not LTS. 4.15 is EOL. So time will tell how this decision pans out for them. But I absolutely think, and I know I am going against the green on this, I know that there are people in the Telegram group, in IRC, they're going to write me on email. I know that people disagree with me on this. I think what the vast majority of people that use Linux in their day-to-day -day life is not rolling. It's not fresh. It's not they want the latest features. It's not they want the latest bells and whistles. They just want it to work. And the way that you get to a place where it just works is you let it bake for a long, long time. And you build a reputation of that thing. It's not new. It's not great. It's not flashy. It just works. And so if you just want it to work, this is the option you go with. Now, on my laptop, absolutely I use Rolling. I absolutely have Rolling. I'm a huge fan of KDE Neon. I love seeing what the latest thing that's coming down the pipe. But you know why that is? It's because I come into this studio, walk down these stairs, sit down in this chair, and talk to you through this microphone about what you can expect. You, the IT professional, you, the person that works in the enterprise that has to make money off of this stuff, that has to use this technology to feed your family and you need that technology to work you need to be able to tell your boss that it's going to work i need to be able to tell you ahead of time what's coming down the pipe and that's the advantage that's what you get for listening to the show you get to find out what's coming down the pipe but you don't want to be on that train you don't want to be on that train unless it's to play with stuff you don't want your production server on a rolling distro and that, I, I understand that that's going to upset some people. I understand that there are going to be some people that are going to look and say, well, you don't understand the true advantage of Linux. You don't understand that that's the way that open source and open code come together and that every project is its own special butterfly and that uh, when we combine those special butterflies, then everything will just magically work. I don't agree with that at all. I think it takes time to look and say this particular version of this particular product, this particular version of PHP, and this particular per uh, version of Apache, they work really well together. We've, we've cross-tested all of these compatibilities. Oh, over there, you want to run this Nginx thing? Okay, well, you go ahead and step into the mix, and you go ahead and try this, and we'll see if your thing works too. And over a period of years, we come up with a formula that works. So I'm very, very interested to follow where this goes. And, of course, we'll continue to bring coverage for you on Ask Noah. We'll continue to interview the relevant people. We'll continue to get, collect information. We'll continue to present it to you so that you, the IT professional, can make those decisions. And we thanks so much for joining us this evening. We had a great time. Huge thanks to Brent for stopping in and joining us. Make sure to head over to podcast.asknoahshow.com. You can download all of the latest show notes, all of the latest articles, everything that we referenced. The Ask Noah Show continues next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central. Huge thanks to Sarah R. Call Screener, Ben, our producer. We'll be back at 6 p.m. Asknoahshow.com. We'll see you there.